So take a few moments to generate or regenerate, remember, your altruistic intention to work for the benefit of all living beings and think that that is your reason for being here tonight. We have the third talk on this topic of uh, the seven types of awareness. And um, I had originally sent you the first part, which we have finished. So tonight we'll start with the second part, part two. I hope you'll have that. Um, and before getting into that, just a few things related to what we talked about last week. Um, so we were talking about bodhicitta and looking at what type of mind it is. And then Malamsal said she thought it was a conception rather than a non-conceptual mind, a direct perception. And then Venerable Nima mentioned ultimate bodhicitta, which is uh, the direct realization of emptiness. And I said, yes, that is a direct perception. That's not conceptual, but it's not really bodhicitta. And afterwards, I had doubt about that. Is that right? <laughs> so I went back and I checked notes that I had from um, when we studied the ornament for clear realization, the Abhisamayalamkara. That's where you have most of the information about bodhicitta, the different types of bodhicitta, and so on. So I did find that I have that note, but then when I tried to find where I got it from, I went through the transcripts. There's two transcripts from the master's program that I did and the first master's program, and I couldn't find it in the transcripts. So then I wrote to the translator, Sugi Tosugi, who was our translator during the course. And she also translated the text. She's very, very knowledgeable about that topic. And she said it's in the, um, it's in the commentary by Jitsun Chucky Gelson, which we didn't have a translation of, but she had access to it. And um, uh, yeah, so it's in there. And I also checked with a friend who is studying in Ganden Monastery. He's a monk, and he's been studying there for 17 years. And so he's very knowledgeable. <laughs> he's very good about answering questions. <laughs> so, so I asked him, and... Um, um, they follow a, a diff different textbooks. The, I don't know if you're familiar with these names, but the, the textbook writer for Sarah J Monastery is Jetson Chuki Gelson. So all the lamas who study at Sarah J, you know, they follow his textbooks. And other monasteries uh, follow, there's another great master, Panchen Sonam Drakpa. And... Um, so my friend in Ganden said, oh, yeah, according to Panchen Sonagrapa, yes, it's true. It's the ultimate bodhicitta. is not actual bodhicitta. <laughs> and Sugi also mentioned another textbook writer for Sarame Monastery. He said the same thing. So there's three um, scholars, Tibetan scholars, who, who say the same thing. There may be other scholars who say otherwise, but anyway. that. So anyway, it is, it is the case, according to those scholars, that ultimate bodhicitta is not actual bodhicitta. And also when you think about it, um, uh, what appears to that mind, ultimate bodhicitta, is direct realization of emptiness. So what is appearing to that mind? What's the object of that mind? Emptiness. Anything else? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> so it doesn't have enlightenment, doesn't see enlightenment, it doesn't see sentient beings. So we say that bodhicitta is a mind that is aiming for enlightenment, wants to achieve enlightenment, so enlightenment is one of the objects, and then it's for the benefit of sentient beings. So that's the other object of the mind. So none of those things appear to this direct realization of emptiness. So it does make sense that that doesn't really fit the definition or the characteristics of, of bodhicitta. But it's, it's still called bodhicitta. <laughs> it's nominally bodhicitta. Um, but then another, another point um, is in the mind of a Buddha, does bodhicitta exist in the mind of a Buddha? So this is something we had talked about when I gave that presentation last autumn. And it seems some scholars say yes, some say no. So Jetson Chuki Gelson, the Sarah J. textbook writer, says yes, a Buddha does have bodhicitta. <laughs> Other scholars, I don't know what their, what their names are, they apparently say no, a Buddha doesn't have bodhicitta. And you can see reasons on both sides. Because if we say bodhicitta is the wish to become enlightened for the benefit of all beings. So Buddha is already there. He's already enlightened. So does he need to have bodhicitta anymore? <clears throat> so that's the, those who say no, a Buddha doesn't have bodhicitta. But those who say yes, a Buddha does have bodhicitta, say he, he wishes for enlightenment for all sentient beings. Yeah, he wishes all sentient beings to reach enlightenment. So he still has bodhicitta. And also, the other day, Venerable Lumsen reminded me there's, there are these 22 kinds of bodhicitta. We started go, going through them last autumn, but we only did a few. We didn't have time to do all 22. But <clears throat> they occur on different stages of the path. And the last two of the 22 are said to be on the ground of a Buddha. They're in the mind of a Buddha. So according to that, yeah. Bodhicitta does exist in the mind of a Buddha. So if we assume that's the case, that a Buddha has bodhicitta, then would that be conceptual or non-conceptual? <laughs> Why? That's what they say. Yeah. In the mind of a Buddha, there's no conception. Every moment, every instance of mind is direct perception, seeing things directly, no mental images, no meaning generalities between the Buddha's mind and whatever is the object of the Buddha's mind. So it seems, yeah, if, if a Buddha does have bodhicitta, that would have to be a non-conceptual bodhicitta. So it seems like bodhicitta could be conceptual, like ordinary beings, you know, we're thinking really hard, I want to become enlightened <laughs> But then when you get to the state of a stage of a Buddha, it's no longer conceptual. It would be direct. And maybe even before. Maybe even the higher level bodhisattvas. For them, it might also be non-conceptual. I'll ask, I'll ask my friend in Ganda Monastery. <laughs> it would seem like once it's spontaneous that it's not conceptual. That it just comes up. It's just... Well, just because it's spontaneous <coughs> doesn't necessarily mean it's not conceptual. It could still be conceptual. Like they say, you know, spontaneous bodhicitta is similar to the thought of food when we are hungry. Okay, so when you're, you haven't eaten for a couple of hours and your stomach is empty and you're really hungry, these, these images of food just start coming to your mind, you know, <laughs> thoughts of wanting to eat food. So those are coming up naturally, spontaneously, you know, without effort. But they're conceptions. They're not direct perceptions. So... But the hunger that comes up is non-conceptual. It's just a feeling that well, comes the up, and then, yeah, this, then the we have conceptual thoughts yeah, about it. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The, the, the um, physical sensation of hunger, that is non-conceptual. But the thoughts about, I want a hamburger or I want a whatever, you know, <laughs> tofu burger, those thoughts, those images that come up in the mind of what you'd like to eat, um, those would be conceptual. So, I'll ask my friend, see what he says. Um, but I'm just thinking, possibly, 
you know, even even a high level bodhisattva might have a non conceptual kind of bodhicitta. Anyway, we don't know for sure. Um, and then Venerable Tarpa had asked me if um, if I could explain how Chandrakirti refutes self knowers. <laughs> But I haven't had time. It's been really busy last week, right? We had <laughs> so much going on. So I just haven't had time. But if you're interested in Meditation on Emptiness, Jeffrey's book, um, on page 375, there's a kind of brief explanation of how he, or how Chandrakirti, how the Prasangika refute <coughs> self consciousness. And it's in the context of their refutation of the whole Chitta Mantra view about no external objects and, you know, objects just coming from the mind and so on. But one thing he does say, which isn't too complicated, is Chandrakirti says, a knife cannot cut itself, right? A finger cannot touch itself. <laughs> I think it means like the tip of the finger, right? The tip of the finger cannot touch itself. <laughs> so in the same way, a consciousness cannot know itself. So this is one thing he says. But I've always had trouble with that because it seems like the explanation that we have here in the Lorik book, it isn't the fact that a consciousness is knowing itself, but it's another consciousness that's knowing that consciousness. Because they say, we, we, for example, when we have an eye consciousness, a visual consciousness, seeing a flower, at the same time, there's another consciousness internally looking at that eye consciousness, perceiving that eye consciousness. Okay? So it's not, according to you know, this explanation, it's not the consciousness seeing itself, but it's another consciousness seeing a consciousness. But maybe it... The explanation regarding the Chitta Matra has something to do with their whole explanation of where objects come from. I've never quite worked that out. It's, it's too mind-boggling, but <laughs> it might have to do with the specific Chitta Matra explanation rather than the Sutrantra so explanation. But anyway, it's, it's there if you want to look at it. And if maybe, maybe we can talk about it next time if we have been able to look at it. Um, so last week we looked at the at direct perceivers. Okay, so what are what can you say about direct perceivers? What kind of minds are they? What kind of characteristics do they have? Just throw out whatever. Huh? They're unmistaken. Yeah, they're unmistaken. Free from conceptuality. And free from conceptuality, meaning they're non-conceptual, and they also have to be non-mistaken. They can't be wrong perceptions like seeing rabbit horns, seeing rabbit ears as rabbit horns, and seeing um, another example they often give. <clears throat> they say if a person has jaundice, they see things as yellow. I don't know if that's true or not, but they look at white snow, a white field, a field full of white snow, and they see it as all yellow. So that would be another wrong perception. That would not be a direct perceiver. So direct perceivers only have to be correct, not mistaken. And then we had four different types. What are the four types of direct perceivers? Mental, Mental direct, yogic direct, and self-knower, which some don't agree with, but anyway. I think the other schools agree with the, the first three, but the self-knowers are controversial. So um, how many possibilities do you think there are between us sense-direct perceivers and valid or reliable cognizers? So can you give examples? I don't know the right terminology for this you <laughs> <laughs> Give examples. Of I think there would be four because there would be some of each that were and some of each that weren't. So, like, there could be a 
sense direct perceiver that was not valid, like seeing two double moons. Is that a sense direct perceiver? Oh, no, it's not a direct perceiver. Sense perceiver. Oh, a direct. Mm. No, I have to worry. Sense direct perceivers and valid cognizers or reliable cognizers. Have to be three then. No, there's four. There's four. Mm. Well, I mean, we haven't gone through all the seven ways of knowing yet, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you have an idea? It's not Example of a consciousness that is not a sense direct receiver but is a valid cognizer um, would be the second moment of an eye consciousness apprehending blue. I have the wrong Wait, hand on. You think you got them backwards. Yeah. <laughs> the second moment of an eye consciousness seeing blue, what would that be? What kind of mind would that be? A subsequent cognizer. It is a subsequent cognizer, yes. But which is a valid? It's a sec. It's not valid. Mm. Subsequent cognizers are not valid because they're not new. Valid cognizers have to be new. First moment. I had the wrong hat on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With the Satantrika school, they say that the this, um, the a mental perceiver can be direct. When it's the, but it's the first moment of the mental consciousness after the direct of a um, visual or sense. Say, I see blue with my eyes, and that's a direct perceiver. And then the first moment of the mind, of the mental consciousness seeing blue is direct. Mental direct perceiver, yeah. So that would be one example there of something that is a valid conscious, but it, it's not considered valid? I don't know if it's a valid cognizer because they say for ordinary beings it's so fast, it's so short, we're not able to experience it or notice it. So I don't think it would be a valid, ex unless you're an aria. If you're an aria, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, if you're an aria, it could be a valid. Wouldn't it have to be valid to be considered a direct perceiver? Not all direct perceivers are valid. Only the first moment of a direct perceiver that is, um, you know, really aware of the object and experiencing the object. So I think the kind of mental direct perceiver in the mind of an ordinary being would not be a valid. But we could think of clairvoyance. <laughs> Somebody who has clairvoyance mm -hmm. and is reading Venerable Tarpa's mind, looking at Venerable Tarpa's mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, they could see very clearly, correctly, what's going on in your mind. So the first moment of that mental direct perception if it's going on for several moments, I think that would be a, a valid cognizer, but it would not be a sense direct perceiver. It's a mental, not a sense. But an inference can be considered a valid cognizer. Yeah. So that will be another example of something that's a valid cogni cognizer, but not a sense direct perceiver. Uh, inference. We're going to get into that tonight, what, what inferences are. A sense direct perceiver that's not a valid cognizer, the second moment. The second moment of seeing blue. The first moment of seeing blue is a valid cognizer, but the second moment and third and so on, because they're not new anymore, they, they lack that characteristic of being new. They're subsequent, subsequent cognizers, but they're not valid cognizers. There's... Yeah, there's still, you know, if we're looking at an object for several moments, the first moment, as long as we're seeing it correctly, the first moment is a, a valid cognizer. The subsequent moments, they're still direct perceivers. We're seeing the object directly without a mental image, and it's correct. So they're direct perceivers, but they're no longer valid. They're no longer new. <clears throat> 
So I think, yeah, I think there are four possibilities between those two. What about mental direct perceivers and valid cognizers? How many possibilities? I think so, four as well. So what would be a mental direct perceiver that isn't a valid cognizer? That is not a valid cognizer. The second moment of an inferential consciousness, inferential realization. Is that a direct perceiver? <laughs> second moment of a yogic direct perceiver? Yeah, yeah, technically it is a mental direct perceiver. But it's no longer valid. But we could also say the second moment of uh, clairvoyance, looking at Venerable Tarpa's mind, <laughs> or anybody's mind. First moment would be valid, but the second moment on would not be valid. And also I think that very brief moment of the mental direct perception that takes place in our minds, ordinary beings' minds, between the sense perception and the conception, I think that would, that's a mental direct perceiver, but not a valid one, because it's too brief for us to notice and remember afterwards that we had that experience. And then a valid cognizer that is not a mental direct perceiver. Should be lots of examples of that. Yeah. We'd have to say the first moment of of the visual consciousness, seeing the gong, or the first moment of the hearing consciousness, hearing the gong. <clears throat> it's a valid cognizer but not a mental direct perceiver and then there is both and neither it's easy to understand okay so it's it's helpful to play around with these and just you get more um, understanding of these different types of minds so let's move on any questions before we move on <laughs> So this next, this next section um, is called Facsimiles of Direct Perceivers. And Venerable Children had actually asked me to talk about these because she said she didn't have time to talk about them. And they also do come, in this book, they do come after the discussion of direct perceivers are sort of added on to that. And so they're called this, they're called facsimiles or pseudo, we could say pseudo direct perceivers because they appear to be like direct perceivers, although they are not. And these, are, these come from this um, early text on valid cognition, uh, Pramana Samuchaya by Dignaga. And there's seven of these. First six are conceptual, the seventh is non-conceptual. I really don't know how important this topic is because you don't hear much discussion about it, but it's there, so we'll go through it anyway. So number one is called a mistaken conception. So this would be a conceptual mind that is wrong, mistaken. For example, thinking that sound is permanent, or another example would be thinking that earth is flat, or thinking that your enemy is inherently bad. In fact, all of our disturbing emotions, anger, attachment, and so on, they're all wrong conceptual consciousnesses. So there's lots of examples of those. And then number two is called a conventional conception. And this is an inferential cognizer realizing sound to be impermanent. So this would be a correct conception. And we'll get into inference a bit later to s understand more what that involves. And the third is called an inferential conception. Um, this is a little complicated. It says, it's a consciousness that apprehends a sign or a reason 
for example, a consciousness realizing the three modes in the proof of sound as impermanent by the sign product. So the syllogism of, for that would be the subject sound is impermanent because it is a product. So you've been learning about syllogisms and the three modes. Is that right? So could someone tell me what the three modes are? It's the property of the subject so that the reason applies to the subject. And, that, and there's the forward probation and the reverse or... Counter, sometimes counter probation. Yeah. So it says the person who has this mind, this consciousness, is just about to realize that sound is impermanence. Like in the next moment, they will have an inferential cognizer realizing this. So it means the person has already realized the three modes. They've realized that the subject, sound, is a product, the sign. They know that sound is a product. That's the, that's the property of the subject. And they also know the pervasion that whatever is a product is impermanent. Whatever is a product is impermanent. And they know the opposite of that, the counter pervasion. What, how does that go? Whatever is not impermanent is not a product. So they've figured those things out, but they haven't yet realized that sound is impermanent. <laughs> but they're just about to realize that. So they've got everything else together in their mind, and they're, you know, ready to have that realization of sound being impermanent. So that's what's called this third type of facsimile inferential conception. What did I say? Facsimile of direct perceiver, yeah. And then number four is uh, called a conception arisen from inference. And this is said to be a consciousness arising after an inferential consciousness, a memory one has had. So I think it sounds like that means so after you've realized sound is impermanent, you, you have the first moment of that realization, that would be a valid consciousness. And then later on, you can remember that. You remember that realization. So I think it would not be valid anymore, I think, but it would be this kind of, more like a memory. Then number five is a memory conception. This is a consciousness remembering an object from the past. So we probably have tons of these all the time. <laughs> all these memories, especially when you're in retreat. <laughs> all these memories coming up from years and years and years ago and so on. And then the sixth is wishing conception. This is about the future. Again, we have tons of these, right? Where I want to go, what I want to do, what do I want to have for lunch, and so on and so on. So wishing for things in the future. I wonder if bodhicitta would be included there. <laughs> wishing for enlightenment. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Hmm? Yeah, all these wishes that we have. I wish to never be separated from the Dharma in all my future lives. I wish to always have perfect human rebirths and so on and so forth. So those are positive wishing conceptions. And then, the, okay, those are all conceptions. And then the last one, number seven, which I guess the term used by Dignaga is dimness of sight. <laughs> And this includes all non-conceptual minds that are wrong consciousnesses. And they could be sense or mental. And uh, another text I mentioned last week, Prabhu Jok, he's, he's uh, another writer of textbooks. And he, wrote all, he also wrote a text on Lorig that's used in the FPMT basic program. So in his text, he explains, um, with regard to sense consciousnesses that are wrong, he says there are four types, depending on four causes of error. This is also mentioned in here, but it's in a different place. <clears throat> so the first is when the cause of error exists in the basis. I think basis here means the sense power. 
Uh, and the example given is seeing a single moon as two due to a fault in the eye. They're always talking about these eye diseases. <laughs> I probably had a lot of eye diseases in Tibet with that, you know, burning hot sun. And so another example they often give is seeing hairs falling. So anyway, I mean, we know there are different eye diseases that can cause people to see things incorrectly or to see things that aren't there. And this is due to the sense power, some fault in the sense power. Or if you have a fault, like I have tinnitus, <laughs> that's probably a similar kind of thing. I'm always hearing these sounds that aren't coming from outside. They're, they're not being made by anything in the environment. They're internal sounds due to some fault in the ear sense power. Anyone else have tinnitus? Yeah. <laughs> hmm? I think that it can take, I think everybody has some sounds, but tinnitus is like really extreme and can be quite annoying. Okay, then the second one, B, is when the cause of error exists in the abode. I think abode here means like the place or the situation. And the example they give in the text is if you're sitting in a boat moving on a river, and you're looking at the bank of the river, you may get the idea that the things on the shore are moving rather than you are moving. <clears throat> I've had this happen in, when you're in a train, at a train station, and it's stopped, and there's a train right next to you, and you see that train moving, and you're not quite sure if it's your train that's moving or the other train that's moving, right? So you might think it's that train that's moving, but it's actually yours, or the other way around. So this is existing in the place. And I was wondering if other examples might be echoes. You know, when you're in a big, in a cave or a big empty building and you talk or make a sound and then it can sound as if there's somebody over there talking back to you. So that's just due to the place, the situation. <coughs> Yeah, I, I think too. It's because it's not a fault of your eye. It's it's because of the situation, the hot sun, and then the dry earth causing this. Um, I don't know what other factors are there, but anyway, it causes this appearance of water where there is no water. Then letter C, the cause of error existing in the object. And the example they give is of. If it, at night somebody has a, 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 a firebrand, or it could be a flashlight or anything, something that makes light, and they whirl it really, really, really fast, then it seems like a circle of light. <clears throat> so there it's the object. And I was wondering another example might be a mannequin. Like... Uh, what are they, whatever they're made of, but anyway, they can be really look. They really look real <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. So if you see a mannequin, and you could easily think it's a real person, or what's that, Madame Tussauds wax museum? <laughs> I've never been, but I've seen photographs, and they really look real. <clears throat> Would 3D movies count in this category? You know, when you're sitting there, and the, they kind of appear like they're popping out of the screen, but they're not quite popping out of the screen. I don't know. I haven't, yeah. I haven't I guess experienced that. I first asked that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess it's when, uh, yeah, something appears one way, but it's actually something else. But in the, and the fault or the cause of the error is in the object itself rather than in your eye, than your sense powers or, no. Yeah. Hmm? Hologram. Hologram, yeah. Yeah, I guess. What about seeing the moon as small? Like when you see the moon, you see it and it looks small to you. But it's actually gigantic. That's because of distance. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, so that would fall under the abode? I don't know. 
Could be. It's not the fault of the object. It's the yeah. It's more like the situation because of the far distance. Things in the distance feel look really small. I guess I don't know. Then the last one is the cause of error existing in the immediately preceding condition. Do you remember what the immediately preceding condition was? Previous, Previous moment of mind. <clears throat> so the example they give is if you're angry, <laughs> things appear red. We have that expression, don't we? Seeing red. Is it true? Is it true that... <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, it might have to do with blood, um, blood coming into your, um, more blood being blood pumped in your body. Huh? There's a dilation of blood vessels. Yeah, yeah. And then we also talk about the blues, having the blues. Mm -hmm. Do things appear bluish when you're depressed? Someone who had um, severe depression, and then they did that electrotherapy, you know, where they shock your brain. Electric shock therapy? Electric shock therapy, yeah. In a well, very well, uh, in a team approach with a bunch of skilled people for most of the sessions. Not the last one that she did, but she had it a few times till the last one, which wasn't well handled, but before that. And she told me that uh, the world looked brighter to her. And I've heard this from other people that have severe depression, and then they do something that treats it like that. And they'll, they'll just, you know, you go outside and like the whole, everything seems brighter. So I guess the point is, if there's some something going on in your mind, like some disturbing emotion, anger or sadness or attachment, <laughs> maybe things seem really bright when you're attached. Everything looks beautiful when you're in love, right? <laughs> um, then this can cause some some error in what you perceive. I was thinking about drugs, hallucinogenic drugs. Um, what? And and if you perceive things that aren't there, or you know, get into an altered state of mind and see things differently, which which one of these would that be? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Because I guess it affects your brain, and that would in, in turn affect your senses, your eye sense power, and and so on. So anyway, these are different reasons or causes for why we could have wrong sense perceptions, wrong seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and bodily senses. <clears throat> there could be others as well, but these are the ones that are in the text. So when Venerable taught this, um, I seem to remember, and I'm kind of asking Venerable Chindi and Venerable Sampan if you remember, but this is what I was left with anyway, is that facsimiles of direct perceivers, it's like that we have the sense that these are as real to us as a direct perception. You know, like we, you know, when you say, I can see these lines in the palm of my hand, I have some great certainty about that. That's what I got the impression, that's what was I taught, took from that, that that's why they call this that, like with these mistaken notions that we have in all these different ways here, we think they're as real as a direct perception. Is that ring a bell for <clears throat> Yeah. Well, that's what it says in the book, that they appear like they are yeah. correct, direct yeah. perceivers. I mean, I think we do this, like, all day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Believing everything that appears to our mind. <clears throat> yeah, that, um, I, I too remember it that way, Venerable Tarpa, and really looking at how... Um, because of the, I, I love this term. I've thought about this all these years. This facsimile of direct perceiver, because you believe so strongly that it's as real as if you'd had a direct perception, then you can really get stubborn about, like memory in particular. You said blah blah. I can still hear it in my head. You know. Mm -hmm. 
things like that get us in big trouble. Out of all of these, I don't see how the wishing one fits in there, though. I don't <laughs> think of, I wish something and think of it as real. Or as or a direct as perceiver. As direct perceiver, so that? much as memory. Or, or yeah, you know, I'm going to have a mistaken conception and I just think I'm right, or I wouldn't believe that. But wishing, I don't know. But maybe it's like, you know, we have fantasies. Do you guys ever have fantasies? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, fantasies can, can seem like real, right? When you're caught up in that fantasy, you know? I mean, maybe at some, some part of your mind knows it's just a fantasy, but you can also be totally caught up in it and go along with it and enjoy it or be frightened or angry or whatever. Yeah? Do you agree? Well, I, I did know someone who had a mental illness where they couldn't really differentiate between what they had heard, what they thought, or what they had done. You know, <clears throat> their imagination. They would. He sounded a lot like a liar, but I don't think that he was. I think he was believing things that were happening. Mm. Yeah. Um, but also with the mem with the wishing is that. There's other ways we think about the future, such as, oh, there's going to be this happening at 7 o'clock because that's the schedule, and we think that's what's going to happen. Though around here we've learned that's not always what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. There's just there's very little information. Like in this book, there's only one paragraph for these. <laughs> it's... Not a lot of information. There may be other other sources that I don't know about, but um, yeah. But some of them I find like the inferential conception, realizing sound is impermanent. How how could that be mistaken for a direct perceiver? That's puzzling to me. Unless it's just so vivid that when you do have an inferential realization of something it's just so powerful and vivid it could seem like a direct perception I don't know <clears throat> it might go back more to the origin of why they use that reason um, because the way um, I guess it must have been John Boucher book that we read when we were studying by Bashiko with Jeffrey. John Boucher, was that his name? Yes. Okay, so um, the way I understood it in the beginning of that book, when they talk about the time period that led up to the this whole thing about language and by Bashiko, was that, you know, the, the study of, so the Vedas and all were s sound, and were permanent, but also they had this idea of like this was their physics. They had the notion, actually, Dharma Dignaga, I think maybe is the one who was refuting this. They had the notion, because I read this recently, that um, sound was the object, like the word is the object. They had this notion in uh, not the Buddhist. But I think Dignago was kind of refuting this. And this went, I think this was some of the stuff that, went in, that John Boucher was talking about, too. Um, but yeah, I read this recently. There, yeah, something Dignago was doing was he was saying that, like, no, that we, words are, like what, we, what we've been learning here, we impute them onto an object. You could name anything, anything. But they didn't always have that idea. So if you had their way of thinking where, why they, I, I think this is why grammar and all that was so important because this was their physics. If you think about it from people who think the sound is the word, like you, the, where it went into the notion and the spiritual practice was like people who might believe, and I've met people like this that I used to chant with, um, bhajans, that if you were just to, say these mantras and say these words, your mind would become that through the power of the word. It didn't take so much 
mental transformation, the way we think of and cause and effect in Buddhism. And this is what one thing Dignagra was working against. So if you had that, if you came from that perspective on this, you could think maybe these were direct perceivers. I don't know. So maybe it's too much of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Different worldview. <clears throat> Although the school is different, so but anyway, I was thinking as we were reading it that also it could refute someone thinking that they had realized selflessness when they actually hadn't quite. What could refute this, like this um, facsimile of a direct perceiver, this inferential conception where you just about to, oh, yeah. you might think or you think you're there, perceiver. you mm -hmm. had that realization. You can come out of meditation and think, oh, wow, I realized selflessness, but in fact, you didn't quite. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Because I've heard, in the ter like in our tradition, <clears throat> they say that to realize subtle impermanence, you have to go through logic. You have to use a sign first to realize it inferentially, and then you can realize it directly. But I've heard that in the Theravada tradition, they say that just by practicing like the four foundations of mindfulness, really watching every single moment, <laughs> what's happening every single moment, that you can get a direct realization of impermanence in that way. And I don't know, I can't, I'm in no position to say that's true or not, but I wonder if what they're experiencing is maybe an inferential realization, and it seems like a direct perception. I don't know. That's one possibility. I just thought of that. And then you keep meditating on it more and more, and it gets more and more clear, and then it does turn into a direct perception. So I'm um, confused about the difference between two and three. Is Does three precede two? Yeah, okay. it seems to be, yeah. That's like the, the moment before. You're just about ready to have this inferential cognizer, and then number two would be the actual inferential cognizer. Well, with what you're saying about the Theravadans, they may already have some kind of a, um, concept, a conventional conception of of it, and they are bringing it to direct experience. Yeah. But they've already come up with. They're starting. They're they're getting to the point where they can understand the reason because they have the direct percep direct um, perception of what's going on with the body and seeing that everything is a product that is a as a product is impermanent. Because I think that's really where we stall on that um, syllogism. We can understand that sound is produced. Maybe somebody in the past had it the other way where they believed that sound wasn't produced, but we, we, I think for us it would be realizing the probation, not just, um, not just having a... Um, what would we call it? Not just having a correct assumption, mm. which they don't include in here, but it's later. <laughs> if we get to it, <laughs> it's later down on the list. Okay, let's move on. Um, just oh yeah, the last uh, sentence there. Um, because what we just looked at were sense, um, mis wrong sensual consciousnesses. And then this uh, text for Prabhujuk gives an example of a wrong mental consciousness, a dream consciousness that clearly sees as blue, the blue of a dream. Okay, so if we're dreaming, we dream of an object, blue or whatever. And um, at that moment, believe that to be a real object, not just a dream object, then that would be a wrong <coughs> mental consciousness. So Prabhu Joke says that dreams are uh, direct, not direct perceivers, um, non-conceptual. Dreams are non-conceptual. And this book also, <laughs> well, this book is based on a text by uh, Chambel Sambel. Um, I don't know. But it does say in here, page 110, 
Lati Rinpoche, who's giving the commentary, he does say, there is discussion as to whether dream consciousnesses are conceptual or non-conceptual. People tend to think they are conceptual. <laughs> However, Lama Tsongkhapa does appear to say at one point in one of his texts that there are non-conceptual ones as well. So it does sound like there's different opinions about whether dreams are conceptual or non-conceptual. I don't know if it really matters. <laughs> anyway, the things that appear to the mind when we're dreaming are not r real, are not really there, and that's the important thing, that we don't take them seriously. Okay, then the next thing is just something I've added, <clears throat> because there are these different terms that appear um, when you're looking at the mind and how the mind relates to its object. And usually you don't find any explanation of what these terms mean, but I did manage to come up with some explanations of these, so this could be useful if you're continuing in this study. Um, so one term is appear, and so this is the most basic possibility in that the object merely appears to the mind. Um, an example is, every, it's said, this is what the Satrantika say, everything that is one nature with a table, for example, its shape, its color, and also its impermanence, appears when the table appears. So they say that when we look at an impermanent object, like a table or a flower or a body, <clears throat> not only do we see the shapes and colors of that object, but the impermanence of the object does appear to our mind. But our mind, if we haven't realized impermanence, we're not, we're not able to grasp it. But it does appear. So it says, however, something that appears to the mind may not be ascertained or realized. So there are things that can appear to our mind, but our mind is unable to really grasp it or get it or understand it. <clears throat> and then the second term is apprehend, and this simply means hold or grasp. It means the consciousness merely engages the object. So it doesn't necessarily mean it sees it correctly, realizes it, but just it connects with it, engages with it, apprehend. The third term is ascertain. <clears throat> this is a bit more sophisticated. <clears throat> An ascertaining consciousness is able to induce a recollection of what appears to it, so it involves more than the object just appearing. The object has been registered on the consciousness. <clears throat> so we see a table, and afterwards we can remember the shape and the color of the table. But even though the impermanence of the table appeared to our mind, our mind didn't get that. So we're not able to remember it afterwards. So when we're able to remember things about an object afterwards, that's, that means we have ascertained those things. And then the fourth term is realize. And this is the most, um, I don't know, sophisticated or powerful <laughs> way that the mind re relates to an object. Um, for a mind to realize its object means that it is able to, one, lead to a correct ascertainment of it, so we understand it correctly, and number two, eliminate misconceptions about it, realizing blue is blue and not as red. So this is what happens in a valid cognizer or a reliable cognizer, whatever you want to call it. It realizes its object. Because not every mind realizes its object. But realize here doesn't necessarily mean like a high realization, like a realization of selflessness. Even just seeing blue as blue <laughs> is a realization. It <clears throat> means our mind has realized it. And we see it correctly, and we're able to be sure afterwards that is what I saw, or that is what I heard, or that is what I experienced, and we're sure about it, and we are correct as well. <clears throat> so you can just hang on to this as a 
reference, if you come across these terms later, you can go back to it and say, oh, that's what that word means. Okay, so you're ready to move on to number two of the seven ways of knowing, the inferential cognizers. So the definition of this, a determinative knower, and that term determinative knower means a conceptual, conceptual mind because it thinks this is this, this is that. Um, <clears throat> so inferential cognizers are always conceptual. They're never non-conceptual. <clears throat> And it dep depending on its basis, a correct sign is incontrovertible with regard to its object of comprehension, a hidden phenomenon. Um, so you know about manifest and hidden and very hidden phenomena. So manifest things are things we can just see directly with direct perception. Hidden things, hidden phenomena are things that are not accessible to our <clears throat> our direct perception. So we can't know them by just using direct perception. We, we can know them by means of uh, inference. <clears throat> so that includes emptiness, selflessness, subtle impermanence. <clears throat> Those are the most um, common examples. <clears throat> but also in our daily life, you know, <clears throat> if there's a person downstairs, you can't see that person, right? But if you hear their voice and you know, oh, that's Venerable Sultram's voice. <laughs> so you can't see her, but you can know that she's there. You can, I think that would be an inference. I think that's an, I mean, it may not be a, a valid or, you know, high, highly developed inference, but I think we are inferring based on certain signs, certain evidence that there is something. And another one they, they, they use is no, inferring the existence of fire by seeing smoke. So if you're outside, maybe you're over at uh, Gotami House. What do you call it? Gotami Hall? Gotami? <laughs> Gotami House, okay. And you look over at this building and you can see smoke coming out of the chimney of Ananda House. So then you can infer correctly that there's a fire in the fireplace, or what do you call it, stove downstairs? You can't see the stove, it's deep down in the building, but you can in correctly infer that there is a fire in there because of the smoke coming up. So just in our daily life, you know, we use, we use inference, we infer things that are not directly accessible to our senses. So this is a really important state of mind because these important objects like subtle impermanence, emptiness, selflessness, and so on, are objects that are not accessible to our direct perceive perception. We can't directly see them or hear them, at least in the beginning. So we have to first use inference to know them. Okay, so an inf just reading on, an inferential cognizer is always conceptual and thus is always mistaken with respect to its appearing object, because all conceptions are mistaken to what appears to them because it appears like a real object, but it's just a mental image. <clears throat> However, it is always incontrovertible, meaning it's correct, it's infallible, and thus is always unmistaken with respect to its engaged object, the actual object it's dealing with, and the engaged object is a hidden phenomenon, for example, subtle impermanence or selflessness. <clears throat> it always arises in dependence on a correct sign or reason. For example, product in the proof of sound is impermanent. A correct sign is defined as that which is the three modes, and you know the three modes quite well. Property of the subject, forward pervasion, counter pervasion. <clears throat> Um, and then it says, is, is an inferential cognizer necessarily a prime cognizer or a valid cognizer? There are different uh, assertions about this. <clears throat> Some scholars, for example, Prabhu Jog and Jetson Chuki Gelson, say that 
inferential cognizers are necessarily prime cognizers, which means that only the first moment of an inferential realization is a prime cognizer. Only the first moment of realizing sound to be impermanent or realizing there's a fire in the fireplace in Ananda by seeing smoke. And so when they define inferential cognizer, they include the word new. So it has to be new and incontrovertible. And, um, and then they say that the second moment and third and so on and so on, subsequent moments, are no longer inferential cognizers, but are just subsequent cognizers. So they no longer get that name inferential. Other scholars, for example, Panchen Sonam Drakpa, Geshe Jambel Sambel, he's the author of the text used in this book. So they say otherwise. They say that inferential cognizers are not necessarily prime, prime cognizers. So the second moment, third moment, and so on and so on are still inferential subsequent cognizers. So they have a separate definition for an inferential prog prime cognizer. So they have one definition for an inferential cognizer and another definition for an inferential prime cognizer. So this may be a little complicated. So the next paragraph, I tried to explain it more clearly. So let's just take this hypothetical person named Karen. And let's just say Karen realizes sound to be impermanent based on the correct sign. <clears throat> so she has this inferential realization, inferential cognition of sound being impermanent. So both groups of scholars would say that the first moment of that realization is an inferential prime cognizer. They agree on that. What they disagree about is what to call the second moment onwards. So one group, the first group calls them just subsequent cognizers, and the second group calls them inferential subsequent cognizers. So I don't know if this is super important, but it you know, if you're really getting into this topic, it it's, could be helpful to know that from the second moment on of an inferential realization, some would s still say it's an inference, but some would say no, it's just a subsequent cognition. Subsequent cognizer is the, is the third of the seven types of awareness that we'll look at next. Okay, so there's three types of inferential cognizers. The first is called inference through the power of the fact. So when it comes to correct signs, inferences always arise in relation in dependence on a correct sign. And there's many, many, many different kinds of correct signs. It's really a complicated topic. But this threefold division here is one division of correct signs. So one type of correct sign is called a correct sign through the power of the fact. And that gives rise to this kind of inference. And so this arises in dependence on a correct sign of the power of the fact and is used to realize slightly hidden phenomena. So for example, impermanence, selflessness, and so on. These are considered slightly hidden. And um, so an example is our old friend. The subject sound is impermanent because of being a product syllogism that they always use. <clears throat> so that um, sign, product, is an example of a, uh, a sign of the power of the fact. And this expression, the power of the fact, um, in Lati Rinpoche's book, the way he explains it, he says, this kind of inference understands a meaning that abides in the object, the thing itself. So it understands an object that is established by the power of the thing itself. I mean, the way I think of it is like what we're trying to establish here is impermanence, the impermanence of sound. And impermanence is definitely a quality, a characteristic of sound. It's a fact. It's not just something made up. And nobody can change that. Even the Buddha cannot take away the impermanence of sound. <laughs> it's just an established fact. So simply by the power of that itself, the fact that sound is impermanent, 
we can use logic to understand that. I think that's kind of etymology of this type of inference. And another example is um, the second syllogism here. With respect to the subject on a smoky pass, or we could say the smoky chimney of Ananda Hall, um, fire exists because smoke exists. So I think the, this example is when you're outside and you're looking up at a mountain and you see smoke coming up, but you can't see the fire because it's behind the trees. But you can infer that there is a fire. There has to be a fire up there because smoke is a sign, a correct sign, proving the existence of fire. Where there's smoke, there's fire. So by the presence of smoke, you can know, you can realize the presence of fire and call the firefighters. <coughs> Okay, any questions about that? So this is one type of inference arising through this type of sign. Through the, and, and it's to realize just a slightly hidden phenomena. The second type of inference, um, I'm always puzzled about this one. <laughs> it's called inference through renown. <clears throat> and this is used to realize terminological suitability. So the classic example is, <clears throat> have you come across this one about the rabbit bear? <laughs> I think it's a hard, hard one for us because we don't use that term for the moon. But anyway, I guess Tibetans would make sense of it. <clears throat> the subject, rabbit bearer, is suitable to be expressed by the term moon because of existing among objects of thought. <clears throat> Lati Rinpoche says, we could also say the subject John is suitable to be expressed by the term moon <clears throat> because of existing among objects of thought. So the point here is that whatever is an object of thought, whatever can be thought about, can be called anything by any term. And I was thinking about how, I don't know if you did this when you were kids, but when I was a kid growing up with my siblings, you know, we were given names by our parents, but we gave each other names. Mm -hmm. Do you ever do that? We had nicknames for each other. We had special names for each other. And that was fine, you know? And also cats. I mean, when these cats arrived here, they didn't come with a name on them, right? With a sign around their neck, I am Upeka, I am Mudita. <laughs> So we can give them whatever name we want, right? Um, so we do this, and, and you buildings, you name buildings, you name cars, right? Every car has its own kind of nickname. <laughs> hurricanes, right? They, 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 they give names to hurricanes and cyclones and so on and so forth. So whatever is an object that can be thought about is suitable to be given a name any kind of name that we want, and that can be accepted in the world. But how this is used, I don't know how this kind of syllogism would be used. <laughs> it's, uh, any, any insights on this? Or maybe you talked about this with venerable children. And <clears throat> it, it doesn't seem to match with through renowned when John is not renowned to be called the moon. Um, I could say car, and people know what that term means. But if I, instead I called it a rock, that's not what it's renowned as. So the term is not inherent in the object, but through conventionality, there is a, uh, an accepted convention of what is called what. And it seems odd that you would say John is suitable to be expressed by the term moon. Well, if we, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I could see that he's making a point that that term is not, in, you know, that inherently part of the object in that we have, we have only pasted it on, kind of, but um, we have done that, and we haven't done, they've done that with calling the moon rabbit bear in Tibet, but we haven't done that with John yeah. calling him moon. Well, I think that's the point. Like a group of people could decide 
to use a certain term for a certain object. It doesn't mean everybody in the whole world has to agree to that, sorry. Um, but like this, this community here could decide to call this particular cat Upeka. I mean, she's not known, she or he? He, he okay, <laughs> sorry. He's not known everywhere in the world as Upeka, but in this community, you know, we agree. Um, so I think that's the meaning of renown, that, that it's kind of agreed upon by at least a, a portion <laughs> of, of people. Um, that's my understanding. But if I started calling him Mudita, people wouldn't know who I was talking about. No. But if he ran away from home and ended up in some other community somewhere and they said, oh, what a nice cat, let's call him Boris <laughs> or whatever, you know. And in that family or in that group of people, that community, then he's called Boris. So, and that's fine. So, I, I don't know, that's my, I could be wrong, but that's how I understand it. Because obviously rabbit bear isn't known universally all over the world as a proper name for the moon, but among, you know, some people, that, that's acceptable. But how is reasoning involved in any of this? Hmm? But how is reasoning involved in any of this? Um, it, it says this, this kind of reasoning is used to realize to terminological suitability. Okay, he says, an inference through renown is a consciousness realizing that it is suitable to express an object with a term just because it exists among objects of thought. So it realizes it's okay to call this a gong. It's okay to call this a thermos. It's okay to call this a mala. Okay. Such a consciousness is incontrovertible with respect to its object of comprehension, the terminology terminological suitability. That's, yeah. I guess it would be like a, a learning process where you, um, you get told by various people that this is what this is called and then you learn that's how we call it in this group, in this language. And yeah, like I said, I've always puzzled, like, when and how is this used? And do we all have this inference in our mind because we know it's okay to give different names to different objects? We can name a cat such and such in a car, such and such in a building, such and such. Do we all have this inference in our mind? I don't know. <laughs> do you remember when we were studying Jeffrey, and I think we were in the mind only then, the predispositions for... Speech. I think this really still goes back to a lot of the older ideas. That book, Knowing, Naming, and Negation, they have a lot of this kind of stuff in it. And I think they were pushing against some older ideas still. But the one thing that makes sense to me here is that when they talk about the process of naming things, this is just part a small part, I think, of a bigger huge topic that we don't study much but it's, it's I think it's quite important because it points to how we make generalities and that's quite important to how the mind functions and so uh, so for example I hope we can say this right some systems believe that um, the ins the generality is separate from the instances, whereas Buddhists believe that they aren't. But then, how do the two relate? So, and so, the naming process is a generality. It's a we make a um, a name is a is a term generality actually, but. You know, when we learned about the thing about the sound generality and the meaning generality, so they're suitable to be mixed, but they aren't always mixed. And so we do, when we get to learning about naming things, right away we make a generality so that we can know that when I saw my first 
car. Then when I see my next car, I know it's a car, but I didn't ha it didn't have to be exactly the same as that first car. This all goes to that thing about it being a uh, the way that we have conce the way conception works. And so, I mean, this is just to me like a sliver of a huge topic that kind of blows open how the mind works and then how we move from understanding things inter inferentially to directly. That's the whole point of, in my mind, of concerning myself with generalities and instances and all this stuff that's so complicated. But it points me to how we actually function and then how we are going to realize emptiness directly eventually. So to me, this is like a sliver of this huge topic that they parse out in different places, but actually ends up being quite important. Does that make any sense? Could be, but like in this book, yeah, they don't there's go there very it's, little. <laughs> not there. Yeah, right. It's not in that book. It comes. Yeah. It's in its separate things, and I think it's mostly in commentaries. Actually, um, yeah, uh, there there are some a couple of main commentaries about this topic. It seems, but I don't know. I don't know the breadth of it to say, and I don't know exactly where they study it. Like in where in the curriculum, you know, where it comes up. I don't know, maybe. I don't really know. Maybe it was a topic that was developed outside of that. And that's why we don't hear about it so much. This it is might, what this book, might be in the Praman of Artika. Well, think yeah, Kirti, it could be because, you know, the book by Anne, these two books by Anne Klein are about this. No knowledge and liberation knowing, has a naming. lot about mm. no, yeah, knowledge and liberation. Knowing, naming, knowing, and negation naming, is and one. Negation. It's a bunch of translations. But the one I've studied more is, I think, based on her thesis, which is knowledge and liberation. And they're both about the same topics, but one is more like, the, the one is more dis discourse. Like, she's, she's writing it. She's not just translating. And she's getting a lot of, almost everything from Geshe Yeshe Tupton and other Geshe's that she's put together. And so maybe it comes, in, and there's a lot in there about Dignaga and Dharmakirti, so maybe it's part of their summer course. <laughs> you know, I don't know where it ends up coming in the curriculum. You don't hear about it much. Yeah, if it is in Praman of Vardiga, not many people have a chance to study that. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess it's hard. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, I haven't read either of those books. I've read little portions of it, and it just seemed, yeah, very hard to read. So, yeah, I really can't explain more than this. And I figure you're probably tired by now, and maybe we can leave the third type of inference till next week, because it is a bit complicated. Um, so we'll start next week with that, and then move on to subsequent cognizers. Any last questions before we... Going back to the difference between appear, apprehend, ascertain, and realize, um, the description of appear it reminds me of subliminal messages. And there was a lot of debate. Does this actually influence people's behavior? And I think they found that, yes, it does. But they say, how, you know? And it's because it appears, but it's just not able to be recalled. Yeah, I mean, at some level, the mind does perceive that image that object yeah, and it, and it does have an effect on the mind right. even if we're not like fully aware fully conscious of mm -hmm. it and then uh is appear the same as apprehend are they interchangeable no one um, no. yeah i mean there are different terms in tibetan obviously um and i'm not sure if Mm, like if if the object appears, does the mind necessarily apprehend it? I'm not sure. Maybe not, because like in the example of mm. impermanence, impermanent they say impermanence does appear whenever we look at an impermanent object, but I don't think the mind apprehends it. It apprehends the object, the shape, the color, and so on, but not the impermanence of the object. <clears throat> so I would think my guess is apprehend is a. A higher degree of, of of experience of the object, step up rather than just appear. Because there's one of the seven ways of knowing. It's called um, 
I mean, the, the short form is <clears throat> inattentive perception. <clears throat> and um, an example is when we're focused on one thing, from reading or watching a movie or whatever, and somebody talks to us, our mind does know there's a voice talking to us, but we don't really grasp what they're saying. We have to say, oh, could you please repeat that? <laughs> you know. <clears throat> so there is a certain low level of, of awareness there of something going on, but not enough to really grasp or ascertain um, what, what was that object. So we have a lot of those experiences. <laughs> In attentive perceptions. Determinative knower, is that necessarily conceptual? Yeah. Yeah, the explanation in there is, um, this is another term used for conception. And it simply means the mind goes, this is this, this is that. Right. That's the meaning of determinative. And that is also this is a gong, discrimination this is, is the same. Well, no, the, I mean, I don't know what you mean by discrimination, but... <clears throat> There's a mental factor which is called discrimination, and mm -hmm. that accompanies every mind. Mm -hmm. So even direct perception, even when we just see an object, mm -hmm. before the the conceptual mind kicks in and says, "This is that," <clears throat> discrimination still does recognize certain characteristics of that object and is able to differentiate it from other objects. So, yeah. colors, for example. Just with our eye consciousness, we're able to know that red is different from blue. Even though we don't call it red, that mind, eye consciousness doesn't say that's red, mm -hmm. but it knows it's different than blue or yellow mm -hmm. or whatever. And that's the um, form feeling discrimination. That's the third one. It's an ever-present mental mm -hmm. factor. J Joseph Goldstein, in that book that you've been reading, said something about that that helped me to understand that better. He said... Although they have a lot of different translations for that word, people use a lot of different words for that. What I think discrimination seems to be pretty good. But anyway, he said it like it frames the object. Like that, I found that helpful to think about it that way. You know, like not technical, not technical language here, but just like I don't know, separating it from other yeah. things. Separating it. Out. Thank you.